Okay. Thank you very much, Brian, for a fantastic talk. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Next, we've got Tom Oxley, instructor and neurosurgery director of innovation strategy here at Mount Sinai. Um, as you can see here, he uh, had his education in undergrad and medical school in Australia. Um, he got a PhD in neural engineering at the University of Melbourne, where he then uh, ran an active neural engineering laboratory. He did his residency uh, in neurology at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and then a stroke fellowship, and then came here. Uh, and we've managed to hold on to him at Mount Sinai. Um, his story has been presented at this Grand Rounds previously, but it's an excellent story of an idea developing into a patent, developing into grant support in a lab, uh, and then developing a company um, from all the way from idea to now uh, human trials. Um, and through this process, he's gotten quite a lot of press. Uh, you've probably seen his TED Talk. He's also gotten a lot of awards, Australian of the Year Award, as you can see here and kind of made the rounds uh, with each of the major societies for innovator of the year with CNS, and then also for Finn here. Um, but his work does not only focus on his, uh, what you're gonna hear about today, but he's also been active in other areas of research. And this is an article he was first author on last year um, from our group. Uh, it's been cited 1100 times, and you can see here, it's one of the top cited articles ever uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So thanks very much, Tom. Looking forward to hearing from you today and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Chris. All right, I'll just bring these slides up. Okay. Okay, thank you, Chris. And thank you, everyone. I, I feel like... Um, I feel like a little bit of a broken record because it's been a very long journey and I've presented at this forum a couple of times. So I, I wanted to provide an update and I think provide a little bit more clarity around some of the thinking around this space as it's emerging and continue to bring you along on the journey. Um, Mount Sinai continues to be um, central to our progress and is about to be the home of the first patient implant um, that uh, Dr. Shah Majidi will be um, performing with uh, David Petrino as the PI from a recent large NIH grant. Um, so that's really exciting. So the space is in um, implantable brain computer interfaces. And so I might just take a minute before I get started to, I think from an from a industry medical perspective, the term brain computer interface I thought was not really going to catch on and be relevant in our space. It doesn't really fit into a particular area of practice or medicine that we do. But when the FDA used the term brain computer interface in their um, guidance criteria, their guidance document around this space, I think on the back of the brain gate work and all the investment from these um, US government over the last 15 years, it looks to me like it is going to be a term that becomes adopted. In my mind, you know, moving away now from Brian's brilliant talk on neuromodulation, I see BCI as synonymous with neuroprostheses. And so a neuroprosthetic is a device that restores a lost brain function, the cochlea being the um, primary example of the first device to you know, emerge in that, in that field. So I view the work that we're doing, and in particular, more broadly in this space around implantable brain computer interfaces being synonymous with a neuroprosthesis and it appears to be the case that all of the groups in this space right now and there's now several that have emerged are heading towards the same initial indication and that is severe paralysis but the concept is and, and even the fda are using the term bci synonymous with paralysis but you know paralysis is really a motor neuroprosthesis so that thinking will become relevant as i Tom, this has been relevant in our discussions with FDA and our discussions now with Medicare and what coding will look like. And I think more broadly, as the field emerges, um, how we think about what this technology is. So I'm going to present to you, we've, we've just closed out our first in human study and we're rolling into our second phase of our feasibility study. So I'm going to present some of that data, but I just wanted to um, provide more of an update. So 
Um, since the last presentation, we have been able to finally secure an IDE from the FDA. Um, this has been uh, the first time we approached the FDA was in 2016. So it's been five years, about seven pre-submissions, including breakthrough device designation discussions with the FDA. It's been a long, long process. And we finally got the approval from the FDA um, in July. Um, as a part of that discussion, um, and with a lot of help from Jay Mocco in these discussions with the FDA, we, we were able to um, negotiate with the FDA that this technology should be um, etiology um, non-specific, etiology agnostic. It doesn't matter why the patient has motor impairment, so long as the motor cortex is functioning and the patients are unable to use their muscles in their way, in a way that can you know, achieve functional independence. So the FDA have, have agreed with that in principle, and we've now got um, approval for a broader range of conditions, which speaks to, you know, this is how things happened in neuromodulation and pain. It was for a symptom of pain. And in um, for the cochlear device for hearing, it, it, it was about the hearing, not about the actual underlying etiology. So that, that was a big deal, we think. Um, we've been able to secure funding to move out of this early feasibility stage and towards a pivotal trial program. And that was a major inflection point for us as a program. It's very expensive to head towards a pivotal trial program. We're now heading in that direction. I'm going to show you data from our feasibility study, but really, which is using technology, which is now four years old. So we're now going into a validation process of our next generation technology, which will be deployed into the pivotal trial, but I don't you know, won't be showing data on that just yet. Part of this was, and you know, what I'm learning about in having a technology breakthrough in a new, completely new industry is the way that you quantify the primary outcome measure is not at all certain with this new space. And the FDA recognized this in their, um, they had held a webinar in July talking about how the FDA view technologies in this space. And the FDA themselves recognized we don't have a quantitative measure of motor output. So if you're building a motor neuroprosthesis, how are you going to quantify your degree of unit of motor output? And traditionally in BCI, we've used things like ITR, informational transfer rate, words per minute, but these are, these are not really physiological measures of motor output. So we have, we've been in discussion, we will be assessing measures of motor output that are simple and elegant that can form the basis of of a primary outcome measure for our pivotal study. And then obviously the secondary outcome measures are that you've actually demonstrated functional improvement. Um, the third thing is that the technology, what I'm going to present today is, as you've seen before, if, if you've been at this session before, when I've been speaking is around the use of the combination of the motor derived output function to control like a click and the combination with eye tracking to get over the issue of two-dimensional cursor navigation around the screen. Think of that as we piggybacked on eye tracking to get, um, to get the device working very quickly. Um, we've now moving away from that to a totally self-contained UX where the user is able to um, apply our system as an overlay on top of say Microsoft Windows, um, Microsoft Windows or Apple, or maybe Amazon soon. Um, in a way that you know overtakes the mouse and the keyboard. So that's that's where we're headed for the pivotal study. And I'm going to present, and we've just hit 12 month follow-up for the first in human. So we'll be reporting on this. We'll be hopefully publishing this data in the next couple of months. Okay, so um, touch on the problem of paralysis. I wanna talk about ECOG BCI systems. I wanna talk about our solution and then quite a several number of slides on the neurointerventional procedure our early results, and then a program update on where we're headed next. As I mentioned, paralysis is a symptom of several different conditions, which you could say are um, similar in that motor impairment is a quantitative output measure. So this technology requires an intact motor cortex, but there are many conditions. I mean, in stroke, it's gotta be subcortical. Um, and it, there has to be cortical preservation. Multiple sclerosis is an interesting one, demyelination. Um, how much of an impact on gray matter um, is there? Um, no one has done a BCI yet in multiple sclerosis, but feasibly this could be a po population we could help with. Traumatic brain injury is more speculative. It's spinal cord injury, ALS, muscular dystrophy, and neuromuscular conditions. Even for um, rheumatological conditions that cause um, inability to use hands, I think 
the way we're viewing paralysis is we are now in a world of technology where you can have incredible uh, access to incredibly powerful platforms that give you independence and an ability to interact in the world, which if you lose your ability to interact with those platforms, there is a delta that we think we can restore with this technology. So really what we're building is a uh, tool to overcome functional um, dependence as a result of paralysis mediated through the control of digital technologies. Okay, so Brian was talking a lot about a therapeutic approach towards frequency dependent signal and synchronization and desynchronization. I'm gonna talk about that a lot. I mean, it's why we called the company Synchron because synchronization and desynchronization is the fundamental you know, uh, physiological uh, building block of how, how um, the brain works in all, in all areas. And so Brian was talking about how from a stimulation point of view, you can interrupt or modulate those circuits to derive a certain outcome. We're not doing that. We are trying to record those events so that we can classify that data and then use it in a way that can be pulled out of the brain in a way that the patient can use. And in the motor system, that's so compelling because the patient is in control of these systems. Um, you know, the motor system is kind of the area that we understood the first back with Penfield and all of his experiments. We know how to modulate motor systems because it's linked to intention, to volition. So the goal of this technology is can we classify units of volition, of intention, and turn them into outputs that we can build software around? So the first breakthrough, I think, so, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about, you know, last time I spoke about these different churches of thinking in BCI, of, and I've separated that from penetrating invasive electrodes to surface electrodes. I'm going to be focusing on surface electrodes, obviously, because that's what we're building. We're building a surface electrode delivered into a blood vessel. And so I want to present the thinking around how the use of surface electrodes over time has gotten to the point where we have great confidence that this is going to form the basis for a powerful system. But the first breakthrough was in 2016, in my mind, um, with this New England Journal paper by Nick Ramsey and his group. Um, so this was a patient with ALS fully implanted system for the first time. This was actually a Medtronic IPG connected to a couple of strips, subdural strips implanted via craniotomy for a patient with ALS who had motor impairment, who was only able to use her eyes. And so she had been using eye tracking to some degree of functionality. Eye tracking is a bit challenging. It's um, light dependent. It's quite tiring. It's got to be calibrated. Um, and what they built was a pretty basic um, system, but was very effective and robust. And it, it did, you know, a phenomenon of desynchronization here is shown very clearly in this graph. It's very simple. So this is frequency along this axis. And in the low frequency range around 20 Hertz, when if with the electrode above the area of the motor cortex that controls her hand, when she would try to open and close her hand, which she can't do, but she can try to, when she opened and closes her right hand, the power of the low frequency drops. So that's that's a desynchronization event. And as long as you put a classifier in, the computer can detect when that difference happens. When she then tries to open and close her hand, she's able to basically affect a, a binary output. In other words, a click. And so they combined that binary output with a raster scanner. So a raster scanner is just a scrolling highlighted. So you can see there's a little letter highlighted it just scrolls across the screen. And when she hits the letter she wants, she clicks. And it sounds slow and clumsy. She actually has ended up using this system more than her eye tracker because it's easy to use and it's dependable. The speed of the system is one thing, but um, it doesn't require calibration. It's very easy to use. And so it ended up being very effective for her. Um, and it's kind of similar to the way that a patient with locked in would operate right now with someone, step their carer, standing in front of them and putting a finger across, do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? And they would give you a yes or a no. So took that concept, use this desynchronization and then you know spun that out. So they weren't able to get more than a single output with their decoding with this particular strip. Um, but for me, this was the start of a, of a, um, a vindication that um, ECOG can be useful for a BCI. Fast forward to this year and Eddie Chang's group at UCSF has made huge strides over the last number of years 
in demonstration of the power of ECOG to drive more um, powerful BCI systems. So this is a craniotomy based um, approach. There is quite a large grid. So this head stage is pretty huge actually because of the number of channels. Um, and then they and then they had this. What, so this what you don't well you do see it here. So this system I think it was actually bigger than this. It was like the size of a fridge. Their neural processing system kind of made me think of the you know original cardiac pacemaker systems. Uh, this reflected the size of the computing power needed. Um, they didn't really need this much data. They actually ended up using a certain amount of these electrodes, but they had to figure that out. And so huge amounts of data coming through, really powerful computing system. And then on top of that, a machine learning approach to basically train the model based upon um, content around certain sets of words to then predict what the patient was attempting to say. And so they used not low frequency now, but high frequency features and just to quickly speak about the difference there, um, uh, content recorded from an electrode in the in the high frequency domain is much has a much smaller spatial representation. In other words, you can identify high frequency features and differentiate different you know parts of the body that that's trying to come from much better than you can from low frequency because the low frequency desynchronization events are more widely distributed so they're harder to tell the difference between which part of the body you were trying to attempt to do but in the high frequency domain a lot more content um, the challenge here was that you know this language model this took a lot of training and so the patient it took quite a long time before the patient was able to get this but when it got working if you'd Go and look at the video, it's pretty impressive. Um, they basically were able to predict that the sentence and the words word by word that the patient was trying to do. Now, the error rate was pretty high, um, but it was pretty quick. But I think this was a proof of principle around the use of high frequency domain information content from a surface electrode. Um, it's got a lot of media press um, and uh, you know the, the group is continuing to do incredible work. So we said, okay, so, you know, our concept has been, well, can we deliver electrodes to achieve this type of recording um, in a way that doesn't require craniotomy? And so this has been a program, we're now 10 years in, it's been a long time to get to this. We're now starting to pick up steam because I think we've broken through some very early proof of principle work and we're now starting to head towards a pivotal study. But this is how the device looks now um, compared to where it was before. We've probably the biggest technical challenge we've had to overcome is um, stents traditionally are, are cut from a tube. So they create a nitinol tube, they laser cut the shape, and then that gives it the give it the property of its mechanical properties. So we couldn't do that because we had to build an isolated circuit. This is these are platinum circuits printed onto a self-expanding nitinol stent. So everyone, this is about half a half a millimeter, 500 micron disc electrode, which then has a track that runs along the lattice, which has to be isolated from the stent and isolated from one another. And we've basically found a manufacturing technique to do that, uh, which, is, which is quite new. Um, and that was probably one of the main challenges to make this manufacturable, which we've now done. So this device is a self-expanding electrode. We have 16 channels um, coming down onto this lead, which looks like a DBS lead, which then plugs into a unit. This is our generation one unit, but you know it's um, functioning. This goes under the skin. This plugs into here. These two units are both um, fully implanted. And then there's an external device, which sits over the skin, which delivers the power. There's no battery in this. Um, unit that we've built because the, the power needs are too large. So we've put a magnet into this. So like, think of like the, the MagSafe Apple magnets that just gently clip on. So this bit over the skin clips on, um, and then this plugs into a signal control unit. That's, it looks like the size of a brick. We've got that down to the size of an iPhone now. And then this has a wireless unit. So it'll look a little bit different to what you're seeing here, this generation one system, um, and as mentioned, our, what I'm going to show you is using a bit eye tracker, but we're moving away from eye tracker to be a fully autonomous system that builds a UI and a UX that can operate on Apple or Microsoft or Amazon products. So we finished our first in human study. This was um, a 
five patients we enrolled with 12 months of follow-up using CTV. The primary outcome for these patients was safety. Um, FDA were pushing us on stroke as a primary outcome. And then secondary outcomes from a safety perspective were do blood clots form on the stent? Does the stent move? Does the vessel stenose? So they're the things that we've looked at um, with CTV follow-up. And other things that we're looking at is how stable are the signal and can we, you know, can we drive, can we use the signal to perform tasks for the patient that derive measurable functional independence outcomes? Because that's what will be needed to present to Medicare if we're going to get this device funded, paid for. Okay. How am I doing on time, Chris? I think, when am I meant to finish? You've got 30 minutes, including questions. Uh, so another 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So let's go through the procedure. This has been an interesting process. Peter Mitchell has really been pioneering in this space. Um, he's the head of neurointervention at Royal Melbourne Hospital. And, you know, I think probably the top neurointerventionist in the country in Australia, very careful operator, did a lot of transverse sinus stenting. Um, and he's been leading on our program and it's really been incredible to watch him figure out this process. So to take you through how it works, step one is to first figure out where we're going to put the device. So the patient gets an fMRI. We do really basic tasks, including, you know, hand function and, you know, open, close hand, move your ankle. Um, and then we don't actually bring the, uh, the, the goal is to bring information into the angio suite that's co-registered to give an X marks the spot for the neurointerventionist. That's not really been something we've done has happened before in neurointervention. We haven't had a functional targeting requirement for device placement in neurointervention before. Um, we've kept it quite manual at this point. So, um, and part of this is around the requirement that the device is not very easily visible. We haven't got the radio opacity great. So we've built markers around the bits of the device that we can see to help um, target, but we don't use the fMRI. We actually use the structural T1 and we define the borders of the precentral gyrus because uh, it's, it's different on left and right side and the functional imaging is not that um, um, anatomically accurate. So we do the fMRI, make sure the motor cortex is alive and working. And then we use structural information to build these markers. Um, and we co-register the MRV onto these markers and then bring that into the angio suite. So patient comes into the angio suite, um, they go under a general anesthesia. We, we, we pin down that we don't pin, we, we tape down the head. So the head doesn't move. And then we do a spin in the angio suite so that we have bone information and co-register that with the MR so that then the new interventionist now has three dimensional, they can move the camera around and the, the markers will stay there. Okay. So we're ready to, for the implant. This, we come in through the jugular vein. This is a bit different. Normally your intervention is either through the radial or through the groin. This is how it has to be because we're putting an electronics box into the skin just under the clavicle here. So we use ultrasound to get into the internal jugular vein and we put a sheath into about a six French sheath into the jugular vein. And then we target up into the superior sagittal sinus um, through the jugular vein, sigmoid transverse, and then superior sagittal sinus for the targeting. Um, the device that we have packaged is preloaded into a four French catheter, but the six French catheter, which is here retracted a bit, it was sitting up, well, actually got to here, um, is the targeting, uh, the six French has to get to the target and then it gets retracted for the ready for the delivery. So this is a video of the delivery of the device. And you can see what I mean about it's quite hard to see. So it's being deployed right now, but if you keep your eyes back here, back here, you can see the lead. And in relation to the lead, the catheter is being retracted and the lead is staying put. So you can't see the markers here, but one of the markers I was showing before is back here. So that when you're delivering this, your eyes have a point of reference that it's in position. And then you retract the catheter to deliver. And you can, you can actually see it if you mag up, but in, in this delivery, it's, it's kind of tricky to see. And then this was the, um, and then after the device is delivered, we do a spin to make sure that the, the vessel is still open. But this was kind of impressive when we first saw this, but you can see the lead sitting in the venous system here. So that's, you know, that's the first time a lead's ever been left in a venous system in the brain, which was, um, it's, it's different. Um, so 
you can see why the FDA were worried about blood clotting. The patients are on antiplatelet agents. Um, we check for resistance. There's heparin during the procedure. There's a whole protocol we've gone through. Um, we've not had any uh, vessels uh, shut down, any blood clots form or the device move at all. So we've had a lot of work to get up to the point to be confident that this was going to be safe, but here's what it looks like once it's in. Okay, so now you've got your lead sticking out of the jugular vein, you've held pressure, you've closed, and you now take the lead, you plug it into this unit, we do an x-ray to make sure it's aligned. Um, we bring into the sterile field a probe to make sure it's at the brain signals, we show the brain signals are coming, and then um, we close up. You can see there's a kink here, this is an imperfect system at this point, um, and this sits in the pocket next to the heart um, on the left or the right side. So from a safety perspective, um, we, had, we had enrolled five patients, but the fifth patient only had um, one transverse sinus was down. They were draining from um, only one side and we decided not to implant that patient just to be um, safe. Uh, so four patients out of the five were implanted and we've now completed 12 months. I think um, right now in a couple of weeks, the fourth patient is hitting 12 month follow-up. So we'll be reporting on the safety and early efficacy outcomes. Just to prove what Peter Mitchell was able to do, here is the primary motor cortex M1. Um, posteriorly is sensory and anteriorly is the supplementary motor area. We, you can see that the, we tried to get land the electrodes right over the primary motor. We're a little bit posterior over sensory. We still had enough information for it to be effective, but um, this will become an issue of actual delivery, you know, accuracy of delivery of electrodes. And we'd like that to be a little further anterior. We think there's a lot of content from supplementary motor that can be used for decoding, probably more than sensory. So we'd like to sort of have that error margin of error shifted anteriorly, not posteriorly. And that's something we need to work on as we roll out the study. And then essentially, you know, I showed that graph of, it's, it's kind of basic really what the signal processing here is as a starting point. It's, it's the idea that, um, you know, when you perform a particular movement with a certain part of your body, the device will detect desynchronization and synchronization events that are spatially distributed and representative of particular types of movements. And so we look at, we take all information, the machine learning algorithm takes all information from all electrodes and we go through really simple calibration tasks with the patient to get them moving different parts of their body and then classify those into low and high frequency bands and use them to drive the system. Okay, so electrode sampling rate at two kilohertz, we do pre-processing, we look for those features, we apply thresholds, we apply a logic, and we basically turn that into, you know, think of like a right click on a mouse, um, you know, developing different options given certain features that the patient's in control of. So, you know, hit, for a historical perspective, the New England Journal piece I showed you in 2016 was ECOG click plus a raster scanner resulted in spelling. The Eddie Chang group was using ECOG plus word prediction. And so a language model led to sentence generation. What, so the initial work that we did was ECOG plus click or no click led to eye tracking plus switch mouse emulation. So it looks like a mouse with multiple click functionalities. Um, and that's what I'll show you now. And so some of those things that were very important for the patient to be able to use the system, we realized were things like zooming on, this, on the page to make areas big because traditional assistive technologies have really big letters. And you know we didn't want to build a new assistive technology. We wanted to build a port into these pre-existing powerful platforms like Microsoft and Apple. So things like zoom and click and right click and hold, they're the types of features that we built into the system. So as an example, long click for zooming, short clip for clicking, and I'll show some videos in a minute. Um, and then, so where we're kind of going now is I think for the system to be effective and commercially relevant for patients, it's got to be easy to use and robust. And I think a lot of academic work to this point in BCI has been around getting to an absolute peak of performance using big models and long training periods and calibrations. Well, that's not what's going to be effective for patients. What's going to be effective for patients is easy to use, low calibration, immediate functionality. So we are trying to look at what are the biomarkers, what are the EP signals that are really fundamentally simple and easy to use for patients that they can depend on and not have to train on. And so 
we're starting to look at a lot of different things. And one that we're looking at now is additive is this slow cortical potential. Um, this is a very, very easy dependable biosignal to, to find. So this in combination with desynchronization type decoding starts to, you, you start to see that we're building out a library of EP biomarkers that can drive things. And the question for us is how do we make those into a simple robust system for patients to use? And, um, you know, here's an example from patient four of the difference in that signal quality when you do, say, lower limb versus upper limb, um, which is interesting. Okay, so here's our first patient. He's got Windows 10. Um, there's no hidden tricks here. There's no big, you know, processor in the background. There's just his device. It's plugged into what's on the table here, and it's going straight into the Microsoft Surface tablet. He's opening up a Word document, so he's using a combination of the eye tracking, the zoom function, the click functionality, um, and he's going to start um, writing a book. He's actually written a book, Technopathy for Beginners, which um, is going to be a big hit. Um, but here he is using the system. This gentleman before our system, so he's got ALS. You can see he's still got some head function, but his speech is almost gone. He's got no arm function. He's totally dependent on his wife to be you know, figuring out what his needs are. We've now given him um, WhatsApp, basically. So he's now able to, so I know that the books are not very sophisticated, but um, uh, that's, the, that's the processor over there. It's that brick size I was telling you about at the moment. Um, so he's using WhatsApp now. He can communicate with his wife and his wife is now able to leave the home, which she couldn't do before. Um, he, he finds eye tracking really burdensome to use and doesn't find the calibration challenging, but in the combination with our click functionality, it became a lot more usable. And so we set him up with his Microsoft system and he's you know, able to now um, you know, do things that he couldn't do before. Here's patient number two. Um, so this is just an example of using the long, long click functionality. So long click is an interesting phenomenon. What we've done is desynchronization events have a particular sort of um, ramp up and then drop off. So if you think about clicking, um, when the patients are using the system, they, you, you don't actually think about clicking, you think about pressing your finger down and then releasing. And so the combination of, we, the algorithm can detect the ramp up and ramp down of these particular events. And we use those to drive particular features like Zoom. Um, and then here he is now using the short click. He's applied the modality. We've now connected into a smart home and he's now connected in to be able to control um, the features of his home. I think he's about to turn on a light um, with the system. So you can see, you can get an idea about where the technology goes. Um, uh, you know, Speech is, has been a traditional marker of, of a BCI system, correct characters per minute, but, and we will do that. We're going to report on that, but from a, from a um, device approval point of view, this is not a speech device. This is a motor prosthesis. So it's kind of like saying, you're going to get restoration of your finger to use the digital devices, but to assess that finger, we're going to assess how many words you can type on the keyboard. Well, we're not actually interested in that. We're more interested in how dependable and robust is the motor signal itself. And so I think that's, you know, taking a step back, how can we demonstrate a quantification metric of the motor output? And that's what we're focused on. I mentioned robustness. We're trying to demonstrate that the patients can use this at home on their own very quickly. The first patient took about eight sessions or nine sessions before we had them using it um, independently. For patients two, three, four, that was within the first session. Same for the independent use at home. So after a couple of sessions, the patients are using this on their own, no engineer around making sure it's working. Okay, I'm almost finished. Um, a couple of things we've learned along the way. I think this is also a active area within deep brain stimulation right now. And that is that there is a lot of noise that comes out from the heart. We're recording in the microvolt range. Um, Actually, this is a millivolt range. So in the millivolt range, you can see that this is the level of noise that we're seeing from EKG artifact. Uh, we're recording in the microvolt range up in the brain, which means the heart is really noisy and we need to figure that out. And one thing is that putting the device on the right side of the chest versus the left side of the chest makes a big difference with signal to noise. And that's um, probably going to feed into the way that we designed the pivotal study. Um, and in particular, you know, we've looked in at both upper and lower frequency ranges because you know that we're interested there. And it seems to be that in the high frequency range, there is an even more 
it's there's more of a noise problem. So it's a, up to six-fold improvement in artifact reduction if we shift over to the right side rather than the left side. So we'll publish on this as well shortly. Um, and so just to finish up, you know, I've tried to paint the picture that where we're headed is there's been this academic demonstration of combination of brain signals and applications to achieve outcomes in particular diseases. Um, we've gone from, you know, words per minute has been, you know, uh, ways to assess that. We've looked at information transfer rate, but the goal of our future pivotal study, multiple commands, independent control, so no need for a secondary device, broader application within paralysis, looking at outcomes and functional independence. I think that's what success will look like in delivering this device, hopefully not, you know, to a few people, but to, um, you know, thousands or even millions of people ultimately. So we've we've now have funding. We are launching our study. We have uh, IRB. We have the broad IRB. We're now we're now close to Mount Sinai IRB. Dr. Majidi is getting ready. We're looking for our first patient shortly. We're about to launch this study in the U.S. and it's a very exciting time. Hopefully by this time next year we've got more in the order of twenty patients and we're starting to get closer to the pivotal trial launch. So just to leave you, what I think this technology means. You saw him using WhatsApp. The moment when th this moment, he brought his wife back into the room to show her that he was able to do this. And at that moment, this them their connection, their ability to know that he had a little bit more independence, and the joy and the the feeling that that brings is what is the power of this technology. So it's about opening up the world again, using the power of these digital um, devices, putting them back in the hands of the patients. So. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And um, we are recruiting now. So if you have any patients with severe quadriparesis, um, please, please let me know. We're looking actively for our next couple of patients and we're very excited to be launching this in Mount Sinai. And thank you for everyone. Thank you for Dr. Bedison for being so supportive and Dr. Mocco. Um, it's going to be a very exciting couple of years coming up. So thank you very much. Boy, that was exciting. Brian, who, who has comments, questions? I have a question. First of all, you know, the word heroic cannot be used too much in this because, um, you know, obviously, you know, you made it sound so so smooth and easy, the trajectory to where you are today. And, and you know, having been involved in device development, I, I, I just salute you in terms of the heroic effort it, it took. That being said, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions that I th um, thought um, if I could get your thoughts. Number one, you know, I'm always thinking about ways of getting the FDA and the community to understand the value of a device, especially of this sort in terms of the value added beyond its sort of, an, you know, just base, you know, base use, i.e. motor prosthesis. And you know, in the cochlear world, you know, they've demonstrated that if you're deaf over a period of time, you're going to become demented. And maybe to increase, um, you know, maybe measure the idea that the more connected they are with their environment, that you're going to offset the onset of early dementia. And, and if you could capture that data, that might even further um, help you make the case that this is a commercially viable um, entity. Um, then the, my technical question is, is one because it, it reminds me of North Star's experience doing cortical stimulation for stroke recovery. We did use fMRI. Um, and I, I, you know, I think it's interesting that there was a mismatch between your fMRI. You know, I'm sure that probably was a little bit disappointing. You're like, okay, we did this thing. And yet it turns out it's not quite we can't really use it in a way to target, right? And so did you correlate looking at white matter abnormalities in these regions of these patients as to a reason why that fMRI signal might've been off per se? I'm just curious. Uh, we actually haven't spent that much time looking at the fMRI. We, I think we took a hypothesis that um, there was a limited us spending time um, figuring out the deviation of whether it's anterior or posterior, I, I guess the answer is we're in a pretty limited environment with where we can go. And we know that M1 is the primary target for us. 
And the question is, do we go a little bit anterior or posterior? Getting deeper than that, unless we're, and we're not ready to go into the cortical veins to start targeting other regions more specifically, that, you know, we, we, had a, we had a hypothesis that as long as we're near M1, we're doing all we can. And so the fMRI gave some information about, you know, the parasagittal region, but it didn't really um, show, you know, we, we didn't have that many options about where we can deliver these electrodes. Uh, and did you, I, I, I forgive me, I, you did this under general anesthesia. You didn't do any electrophysiologic interoperative thing to try to ping the area that you can do to see if you get a motor response? No, we didn't. So again, whatever this is worth, one of the mistakes North Star made in their pivotal trial is in their initial phases, that's one of the things that they critically did in the operating room to con absolutely make sure that their cortical electrodes were engaging with the motor system. Mm -hmm. Eventually, because, you know, trials are all about how do we do it cheaper and can we get away with doing the other thing? They decided we're going to just do it anatomically. And there were a whole host of electrodes that ultimately did not, were not capable of mm -hmm. actually creating that motor response. And again, it's not a hard thing to do. And you might want to consider using that as a confirmatory thing in the operating Thank you, Brian. I think it's a really, really important point. We actually were discussing this just this week, and I think it's something we probably would like to consider. The reason I think we put it out of our mind was that when we first approached FDA, and this has been a challenge that other groups are facing, is that the FDA want you to put the device in, show that it works, and then take it out before you go to the permanent implanted. And I think other groups are having this challenge, especially with penetrating electrodes. So when we what we 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 did our animal study and we found that our ability to record signal improved substantially over the first two weeks due to presumably endothelialization and so we were worried that if we did this and it didn't work um, then we would make a decision based upon reasons that actually would would solve themselves over time but now I think we're beyond that I think we I think we probably will look to bring back in some element of intra procedural anatomical confirm confirmation. So thank you for the comment. Hey, hey Tom, Costas here. A amazing talk. I always enjoy, you know, your updates and, uh, you know, it's been an exciting voyage for sure. Um, one of the things that, you know, uh, as I've watched this field grow and see some of the challenges overcome is with long-term use of BCIs, yours is actually, as you proposed, a different paradigm in terms of neuroprosthesis is the scar tissue buildup at the interface and how that kind of interferes with signal um, recordings and, and other types of uh, things that you're doing. So, you know, in the, in the vascular space, you know, I guess logically you'd think that that may be less of an issue, but is there long-term buildup of endothelial cells around the stentrode that could interfere with some of the, um, the responses you're looking at? So the, the impact on impedance that impairs recording in the penetrating electrodes, you're talking about with penetrating electrodes, you're talking about, you know, I think they're about 70 micron in size. And in the brain, there's this gliosis response. In the blood vessel, you have a neointimal neo hyperplasia response, which actually gets to a point and then stops. And so we've, we've characterized that over time and there's a threshold. It's, it's about, we get 95% endothelialization within 45 days. And over that time period, the signal state, the, the impedances stabilize and then they stay put because I think that's the difference between going into the brain and staying out of the brain is that we don't have the issue of ongoing inflammation and gliosis. So it seems to be the case that we have a stable um, and characterized and defined uh, process. And then the other point is because our electrode is more like 500 microns than, you know, 50 to 70 microns, we're not, we're not, those impedance changes have less of an impact because we're looking at LFPs and ECOG. So they're more durable, robust signals. Ben, Ted, Jay. Hey, Tom, it's Ted. Um, amazing work. Always so exciting to hear you on this. And I'm sorry for the long-winded question. Um, I just want to address the concept of potentially cosmetic neurosurgery. So you guys probably know bariatric surgery, right? Started out in the battlefield, now is accepted to improve people, not just patients. Cosmetic surgery, same thing. 
the idea of cosmetic neurosurgery has been kicking around for the past 20 years or so. And I wanted to get the sense from you, you know, you guys will get into La Bay eventually, you'll get into Trollard, you will be able to target these areas. Have you had requests as of yet to improve people who are not patients? Um, you know, the light side of this is learning a language in two weeks instead of two years. The darker side would be improving a reflex of a fighter pilot so that he wins the next dogfight. Just wanted to get the sense from you because I believe in the next 20 years or so, this is going to be the future. And uh, I think your technology with ease of access is going to be the first uh, four way into it, which is invasive in any way. Would love to hear your thoughts if you think that it will go that way. And how do we protect ourselves from potential moral issues? Yeah. So I think the, the discussions that I've been having with investors have, have changed. And Elon Musk has come out and um, unashamedly said that the reason he's doing VCI is because uh, we face human humans face an existential threat from robots and AI, which the only solution to is to connect directly our brain to computers. And it's pretty wacky. And some investors are buying into that and others are not. I think at the point that we got our last major amount of, it's kind of, it's very important who is helping us. And at the point of our last major funding round, we, we made a philosophical decision that we're building medical device technology to help patients. And we think there's huge potential there. We're not really on a trajectory to build systems that, you know, will be used by jet fighter pilots. So I think, you know, it's probably, it's probably, it probably doesn't matter anyway, because I think you're right in that we're talking about something that's 20 to 30 years away. So whether or not that happens in the future, I think we'll wait and see, but we're, we're not building that technology. We're not intending to do that. And I think, you know, I think there are, this technology has the potential to hugely change um, patients' lives and there's a lot of work to do there. So we have taken a view that um, neuromodulation and also neurodiagnostics and something I'm really getting excited about is looking, I've sort of been studying what happened in the cardiac space Cardiac went from interventional to electrophysiology, cardiac EP. And cardiac EP, the huge inflection point with cardiac EP was the Biosense Webster technology that basically mapped the heart. Um, and the reason they mapped the heart was because they could do these ablative technologies that led to improved outcomes and now AFib. And so I think the neurointerventional suite has something to offer in terms of being a domain where we can get really good intracranial EP data without having to do craniotomy in a way that could open up other fields of medicine. So I'm pretty focused on building medical device technology. The stuff that's going to happen out in the future, I think will happen, but we're actually putting together an ethical, you know, I think the government recently, just a couple of weeks ago, the government, put, the US government put out a call for um, public comment on how they should view the biosecurity of exporting BCI technology. So there's already, a, and, and I think China right now is doing a lot. I don't know what exactly what, but there is significant investment going on from Chinese government into neural interface technologies in a way that is unashamedly, you know, military armed stuff. So I think as we move forward in the next five to 10 years, the space is going to get very hot ethically and I'm pretty determined that we're not doing anything like that. We're building medical devices. So, thank you, Tom. Jay, can I? Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Hey guys, um, I don't know. I can't see me. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I mean, there's not much to say. I think Tom's hit so many things on so many levels. It's been a real tremendous experience and privilege on my end to be able to. Uh, see him grow and 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 uh, engage in this experience. Um, when Tom was finishing fellowship, we sat down and talked about what his vision was, and I think there's a lesson there for the for the fellows too, and for the residents. Um, thought it would be, you know, he had to challenge himself to really sit down and think about what did he want to pursue. Uh, was he passionate about this dream to deeply chase it and face it and make it? Uh, what it is today and where it's headed, or did he want to keep it as a sort of uh, side project as he pursued a more traditional path? And he came back with the courage to say, this is really what I want to do. 
And so then we found an atypical way to keep him in, in the department and keep him involved and, and have him pursue uh, this vision. And I think there's, there's something there that challenges all of us to not always get put in the same boxes that everyone else is in, but figure out how we can build our own box around whatever shape it is that, that we want to have our lives. And I think Tom gets a lot of courage for wanting to do that. And Dr. Betterson, you get a lot of courage for allowing him to do it. So it's, it's a pretty neat thing. And I think it's something special about what our department and Mount Sinai is to allow that to happen. And I think it's worth putting that out there. Awesome. Hey, Tom, it almost sounded for a moment there like you were describing a new language that you are, you're, you're translating EP signals into something that is understandable by the computer and by the person and by your team. Have you thought about engaging a linguist in trying to elaborate on some of these concepts? Because they're really fascinating concepts. Um, I, ha I hadn't thought about engaging a linguist. That's an interesting idea. I mean, I think, I think what we have done is we're not, we're not discovering the biomarkers. I think what's happened over the last 20 years is these biomarkers have been discovered primar primarily through the um, epilepsy domain from all of the um, subdural array work um, in, in seizure monitoring. And then the experiments that have happened on the motor psychology side um, with people like Ogeman, Miller, um, you know, there's a huge body of work. We've just gone, looked at that body of literature and said, what are the most dependable biomarkers and how can we then use them and make it really simple? Um, but the linguist concept is interesting. I'll have to go away and, and think about that. Thank you. Dr. Mayberg. Um, yeah, that was really just so many things on my mind. Um, I did want to just kind of offer, I mean, I think one on the ethics thing, this is just a continuing saga. Everything new, just do what you're doing. Keep your head down. We've found, you know, we're, we're dealing in a psychiatric space. Uh, you, you can imagine the kind of attacks and thoughts and worries. My motto is always, look, we should be so smart. And actually right now, just getting what we're doing to work for the patients to not make people better, but just have people back to their own baseline is the aspiration and, and that works. So that the rest is all just noise right now. And, and there, I, I can certainly, you should be introduced to some of the neuroethics groups that actually have taken this on and not get distracted. The more interesting thing is that I wanted to bring up that might be helpful kind of, again, extending what Brian said, this localization, what was learned in the TMS for depression world was that you know, they looked at finding, you know, the hand knob and then going some X number of, you know, centimeters in front of it to get their target for TMS for depression. And what actually has helped to refine it with, again, it's not as good as it needs to be, is not, is not using that kind of localizer, but using fMRI to find the area of the target that's anti-correlated in the fMRI with a deep structure. And in that case for depression, it's our depression target. So prefrontal cortex to area 25, there's variation of where the optimal anti-correlation is. And I think that, you know, just like when you're doing M1 to STN for movement disorder, that connectivity, there's structural connectivity, but you may be able to maximize or take advantage of a functional connectivity. So your localizer in advance could be done with your MRI, but actually you're adding another leg instead of just the focal activation. And, and, and that just might be a way to compare kind of where you think your target is. And um, we've got some methods that, you know, or there's a lot written, I can get that to you. Um, Thank you, Helen. Ben, I'm sorry that passed over you. Did you have a comment, Ben? Oh, I mean, I have so much to say, but first, let me just say, Tom, this is inspiring work and congratulations. It's just amazing to see what you've accomplished and I can't wait to see what um, what comes next. I, I had kind of a, a technical question that I, that I was interested in. You started talking about the FDA's metrics for motor control and maybe there wasn't enough time to, um, to delve into that, but I'm curious to hear what your, 
little bit more about your conversations with them and how you all have um, decided to quantify outcomes in these patients? Uh, so the what I'd say is that the FDA don't the FDA held their webinar and they said we we recognize that the uh, quanti quantification metrics are unclear and that this is going to be uh, this is going to be well, basically we're going to give you a pass. And I thought, huh, that's interesting and concerning because you're not going to get a pass from Medicare or any insurance agency if you start using a non-validated scale. So I think it's a real challenge and a real problem for the space, especially when the FDA recognize that they're going to not worry about this because it means that there's a trap that you can fall into of building a clinical study that ultimately Medicare are not going to be satisfied with. So this is something we're really focused on right now. So we've engaged Medicare CMS and we're exploring what our different options are. It probably is going to be the case that we have to come up with a test and very quickly work to validate it. And I think Dave Petrino and his group are looming as a really critical um, academic group by which to sort of start to run with what this metric should be. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we've got some ideas on what it is. We're trying a few things out. Um, and, you know, I, I basically say that it's, we, we have looked in the literature of what is already there, tried to modify it as, as little as possible and built it around, you know, some of these, some of the, the basis on which these electrophysiological biomarkers are representative of motor intent is kind of the concept. This is actually an, an area where I think uh, is ripe for collaboration, even within the industry, because it's, it's one of those areas where, um, where there's, there's so much at stake and there are multiple groups uh, going after approval and it's to everyone's benefit to, to have a common framework. Right. So I, think, I think this is an area that's, that's just ripe for, for collaboration. I agree, I agree. I've actually, I've reached out to four of the, I've got four of the five Neuralink leadership group, except for Elon are kind of on board with us doing this together. But um, then our group was kind of like, well, we've got to kind of, you know, it's, it's got a, it's got a, um, a lot of work's gone to this point and we want to get it right. But it could be that as, if we, if we approach together, we could be much more stronger together. And obviously Elon's got a huge amount of lobbying power and potential. So it's something that we're looking at. Past nine o'clock, but uh, we've got a few more comments and it's a great discussion. So I'm just going to let other people comment as well. Um, Brandon, do you have a comment? Yeah, hi, Dr. Oxley. Um, this is Brandon. I had a I had a question about um, some of the devices that the the center was able to integrate with. I, I know you've mentioned the tablet as well as controlling some some light switches. I was interested to hear about um, what other technologies uh, as the devices right now is is it capable with integrating into um, what what is the interoper interoperability of your device with these other devices and and what is the potential mm -hmm. to control multiple devices simultaneously. And then, um, furthermore, is has the FDA actually uh, regulated what what devices the the Centrode is allowed to integrate with right now? Yeah, yeah, it's been really interesting. We've I've recruited someone from Facebook to lead us on the product development side, and she she has not come from a medical device company, but she has brought in a very different thinking and approach towards how we should think about product development, the cycles, the platform approach, the software updates, the you know development cycle. It's totally different to what we're used to, and it's made it's given us a, um, a you know a, a way of thinking about how you know it, we're somewhere between a medical device and a technology platform. But the way we're thinking about the interoperability is it's a Bluetooth related signal, so it should just pop up in your Bluetooth. It should just work on a Microsoft platform, on an Apple platform, on any on a Google platform, on an Android platform, in in the same way that a um, a wireless mouse does. So that's how we're thinking about interoperability. However, it creates a challenge with FDA because FDA don't necessarily think about things like that. So we've had to go back and look at the industry, look at historically, how, was this solved anywhere else? The closest we've found is with cochlea. Cochlea recently were able to separate the class three designation on their implantable device into a class two. And the designation point was at the point where the Bluetooth connects from the cochlea to the iPhone. 
So our strategy is to basically disconnect the class three representation of our device into a class two designation so that we can iterate rapidly and be able to continue to work on different platforms. So we're focused on one particular platform now, which is Microsoft, but we're working towards others. And it becomes a question of really working with FDA in a way that's going to let us continue to, we would, our goal is to be able to, to be releasing 12 month updates with our software platform. And that's something that FDA is not particularly used to and a, a challenge that I think we can overcome. Um, from the data you've got so far, do you see a bandwidth limitation, um, an upper limit to what's feasible with your device or yeah. the data you're able to acquire? It's a great question. Um, so we've got 2000 sampling rate right now, which means our ceiling is around the 500 hertz. So your question is, what are you losing above 500 hertz? And there is a lot there, but it's all a trade-off. So if you increase your sampling rate, you know, and I think there's been a focus on data rate, data rate, data rate, but there's a cost for that. And uh, the cost is power and the size and the implant. And we're really focused on simple, robust, dependable, usable systems. So we think we've got the sweet spot. We think there's a huge amount of information in the sort of not, not even like in the 500 hertz range, I think in the 100 to 200 hertz range, there's a huge amount of content and our electrode is still, you know, we would like to be moving into the smaller cortical veins before we make wholesale changes to the electronics. So we, 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 we're pretty confident based upon the ECOG literature that we've, we've got the right trade-off. Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody.